Right. Hello, everyone, for that very last session on that uh, nice conference. Thank you for that kind of introduction. So, uh, you most likely, uh, oh, sorry, it doesn't switch slides. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's what, what, uh, what you've heard already. So, uh, my name is Arthur, and uh, I'm a Python engineer on my daily basis. And uh, today, uh, I would like to talk uh, to you about uh, some experiences that I gathered during uh, quite a large project that I was developing uh, along with my team, and how we have uh, created uh, a GraphQL umbrella or API gateway for uh, our project, which was con consisting on, of a lot of different microservices. So let's move on. At first, microservices. Please raise your hand if you ever have used microservices in your project. Whoa, that's near full house. And now, please keep raise your hand if you always implemented those microservices by the book. So you kept all those uh, responsibilities divided, you always used loose coupling, and uh, you never did anything wrong. All right, nobody, myself included. So what happens if uh, you don't follow those guidelines, those rules that uh, our industry advises to use? Well, you accumulate tech debt, most likely, and uh, you end up uh, in not very nice place uh, because you need to always deal with all those uh, trade-offs quality versus time versus effort put into developing a certain feature. And that also means that distributed systems getting, are getting complex over time. And instead of having a nice and divided uh, microservice architecture, you ending up in such a mess. So everything is interconnected and everything uh, requires everything else in the system. And uh, yeah, I was also there. And uh, in our project, we had uh, um, architecture that used to be called a microservices, but it has some fluffs of a distributed monolith, unfortunately. So what it was? It was a basic, or maybe not that basic, but e-commerce platform that was essentially selling uh, stuff, so taking orders from the customers, doing some background processing and forwarding them to the suppliers to fulfill. And we, heard, we were been doing that using almost 15 plus microservices do, uh, written in various technologies. So more modern with, with Fast API, some older ones with Django, and there was even some components that were written in Tornado or plain async IO. So quite a lot of different stuff. So let's draw it at first. We had an auth service, which was responsible for authorizing users. Uh, we had an order service, which was taking orders. A product service, which was offering those products to be purchased uh, by our customers. And a few more uh, of different ones that uh, are not that important. So all of those services were exposing plain REST API and they were communicating mostly over REST API, unfortunately, so that's why they were, it was a distributed monolith, unfortunately, not a microservice architecture. And also they were exp exchanging some asynchronous messages using RabbitMQ. And up to this point, it's not that bad. Okay, we have a lot of services, but it looks manageable. What's in the other end on the project? So what is the consumer side? On the consumer side, we had a few React-based applications which were communicating over that REST API with all of those services. So we had a storefront application which was the primary point of contact between our customer and the system. We had a back office application where, the, uh, where our employees could uh, do some support for the customers, so see the, spe uh, the specific order uh, or the statuses and maybe switch them on or push something forward if something doesn't work. And still up to this point, it looks manageable. So what was the goal? Uh, 
the goal of the backend engineering team was to create some more microservice-oriented architecture instead of that kind of beast. So we wanted to keep refactoring the services, maybe combine some of those, maybe introduce something new if it was really needed. And on the other side, the front engineers wanted to keep using the API and they really wanted to avoid breaking changes. So why was that problematic? So in, uh, instead of having only those two applications, we had also a third player in the party, the business. So our business stakeholders were really uh, eager to introduce new checkout system. So they wanted to have extremely new checkout experience, which was uh, like natural for our front engineers to create with another front application. And of course, there were some rumors that we are about to go full into the mobile application because everyone likes mobile apps nowadays. So how those, uh, how those front ends were communicating with the back end? So the storefront needed to know how the user or who the user is, right? And also the storefront also needed to display the history of orders once user logged in, pretty standard e-commerce behavior. And finally, the storefront needed also to offer some products. And most likely you already see where I'm coming to. Uh, so all of those services were completely aware how the system is constructed, what are the components and where to look for the data. And it was nearly impossible to refactor that system without introducing breaking changes. And uh, that was a problem that uh, both front engineers and back engineers needed to fix somehow because we needed also to expand, create new features, and we couldn't afford spending the entire year uh, on refactoring, right? So we sat together and uh, kept thinking how to fix that problem. So at first we thought, okay, that there is that nice pattern in the industry called back and forth front end. Okay, those slides are slightly misaligned, sorry. Uh, so back and forth front end. And uh, in that approach, uh, storefront application would have its dedicated backend API, which is entirely focused on uh, creating uh, the subset of APIs that, that are specific for the storefront, right? So display list of products, display history of orders, and so on. And also back office API, display list of all orders across the system, all users, all products, and so on. And that look kind of promising. However, it's not even remotely close to, limit, to reducing number of the services in the system. And uh, given our, uh, our size of the, of the team on the bucket, it was unmanageable to introduce even more to, to the stack. So we started to think, what are the other approaches? And also, it's worth mentioning that in that approach, we will uh, have a lot of uh, business logic application because fetching orders will, uh, will live both in storefront and in, uh, in uh, back office API. So we, in the end, uh, decided that we w uh, would not follow that approach because it was just too lot to carry. So what was the other uh, approach that we have, uh, we have est uh, established? Well, instead of having a four new API gateways, we decided to have just one. So that's another like a trade-off uh, in, uh, uh, in the API architecture because we indeed introduced a gigantic single point of failure in our system. However, we decided that this is the trade-off that we would like to uh, move on with because we have nice infrastructure that scales and deal with, it with that kind of cases. And within that approach, we will be able to connect all those front applications to the backend without uh, 
letting all those front up apps to know how the data is organized under the hood. And here, GraphQL comes quite handy because uh, as you might already know uh, from the previous talk, GraphQL is a query language that is, uh, uh, of course, developed by Facebook and open sourced, but uh, uh, first of all, it's statically typed. And that's a main feature that is really useful, especially when your front end teams is in love with TypeScript. Because there is a lot of cool tooling around that allows them to just use those static type system. There is other kind, kind of cool feature of GraphQL uh, because it's protocol agnostic, uh, which means that you can essentially format your messages using GraphQL, but you could exchange those messages over any medium you want. Of course, all of us, we are web developers, so we will use HTTP for that. But uh, it doesn't matter that much. You could safely use, for example, RabbitMQ or any other message exchange system just to exchange messages formatted as GraphQL. So how it looks. In GraphQL, we have a thing that is called GraphQL schema, which is uh, essentially a contract between the front-end apps and the back-end system. So in that uh, simple example, we have uh, a query that uh, type query uh, is responsible for uh, outlining what are the read operations from our system. So we are able to fetch list of orders. And each order is very granularly typed. So we exactly know how the order uh, looks how it looks on the client side. Why it's, is it even useful? So that schema is especially handy because it's used both on the client side and on the server side. So the client fetches schema that is exposed by the GraphQL server, and before it does any GraphQL query or mutation that mutates the data, it validates locally the data, the query that is about to make to the server so it could eventually raise an exception if something is not valid without even bothering the server. However, if everything is fine, we call the server and we execute queries and mutations uh, formatted in, uh, uh, by using the GraphQL schema types to the server. The server also validates if everything is fine according to the contract and if, it's, if, if everything is fine, it returns data to the, uh, to the calling client. And here uh, is also the important part, because the data is uh, uh, returned in uh, the same way that is, it was asked for. So the client essentially uh, outlines in the query what kind of data it's interested in. And the data will be returned in the same form in the same order, and there won't be more data returned or less. There will be always everything that was requested. So uh, moving on, that's the simple uh, GraphQL schema that uh, would be used in my further examples. So uh, we have a query that is returning orders by a given user uh, by taking its order ID, and we have uh, the uh, the order uh, type and the user type as well. And here also is a pretty cool feature uh, that is called schema uh, directives. Uh, if you attended Patrick's talk, you most likely are very familiar with that. This is a built-in one uh, that allows you to do uh, safe deprecation in your API, um, uh, API structure. So every, cli every client that will be using a deprecated field will be notified on that validation level that he is using a deprecated field and the developer should consider refactoring the client. Okay, let's move on. How to use GraphQL in Python, you may ask, since we are on the EuroPython conference. And there are a few approaches, as always. So I believe the most mature one and the oldest one that I can know is Graph in Python. Graph in Python is a library that uh, is a, a code-first uh, library, which means that you need to know Python uh, in order to create GraphQL server. Uh, 
So the syntax looks for me pretty familiar to the Django REST framework, if you are familiar with that tool. So essentially you are creating classes which contains, uh, which contains uh, framework native uh, fields and after, uh, after processing, those fields are generating the schema, which is later on used by the, by the client. The other approach is presented by Strawberry, uh, of course, uh, and in this case, it's also code-first approach. However, the code itself is more straightforward and it's focused more on Python native type hinting. However, still, in order to keep the, uh, the schema up to date to modify it, you need to be a Python developer. And you may ask why that even matters. So this is a third approach, or second, <laughs> third library that is called Ariadne library. And uh, this is uh, a library that is uh, a schema first uh, GraphQL library, which means that you need to create both. You need to create schema file uh, in .graphql files, and later on, you need to load those files into your uh, Python code, and from the Python code, you are mapping those schema entries and operations into the, um, into the Python resolvers. And which one should you use? Schema first or code first? As always, it depends because it really depends on your use case, your project, and how are you working with your API. Let me do a quick comparison of all those three tools. So, those are looking really bad, sorry. Uh, so in schema first, uh, your front engineers uh, could really contribute to, uh, to, this, uh, to the schema development process. So if you, if you attended the f uh, previous talks uh, about creating behavior-driven uh, applications, uh, that schema could be your like, ubiquitous language be between front-end and back-end engineers because essentially what front-end engineering team could ask using the schema, the back-end engineers would need to deliver and there will be no more arguing about why that field is null or not, or it's a list or a single field. In code first, on the other hand, the entire uh, schema development and server development thing is heavily backend focused, and as I mentioned a few times, you need to know Python to develop that code. And also, in my opinion, it's hard to predict what kind of schema will be generated because it's really up to the framework because how those fields are mapped to the, to the schema, uh, it's only known if you, if you really know the framework that you are using. In schema first approach, you have full control over how your API is, de is defined and it's really easy to track changes because the schema files are essentially yet under artifact in your code repository. So everything is visible. Unfortunately, there is more code to maintain. So the decision is up to you. In my uh, use case, I followed the schema first approach because I had that first use case here. So the team of front engineers would like to contribute to the API structure. So they was really eager to, uh, to define what kind of schema they would like to have on the end. And what kind of features were really useful for a GraphQL gateway development? So that was uh, the system that I uh, presented to you already. And here is our query. So why do you, do you even bother to introduce GraphQL there? So in that query, we would like to get list of products uh, ordered by given user. So for each order, we need to display product name and its price at uh, the order time. And that's kind of information that is kept in the order service. And also the designer designed a reorder button. So we need to know if the product is still available. However, the order service is not aware uh, because it's not the context of the order service, right? 
So in order to deliver such information, we need to contact the product service to resolve the product uh, from, uh, from that order that we uh, had at hand. And that uh, composed information will be returned to the storefront. So we have broken that tight uh, coupling between orders and products and the storefront, and we abstracted it with a GraphQL gateway. Now only the GraphQL gateway knows how that data is uh, oriented on the, on the backend. And all those uh, things are possible and they are performant enough because the resolvers that are tied into certain fields are fully asynchronous. If you are mapping your field to a resolver, you are able to do any logic you want. So for example, you could do an underlying REST call uh, with, uh, with some asynchronous uh, HTTP library. You could also do a database operation, cache operation, or you could even reformat that data, that data on the fly because the front end could need the data in slightly different format that you keep in our API. And all that things you could do on the resolver level. So is it everything that colorful, full of rainbows and unicorns? Well, no, <laughs> it's not. So there are a few drawbacks and caveats that uh, you need to be aware of uh, before you jump into, into implementing GraphQL in your system. First of all, error handling. It's completely different uh, from error handling that you know from the safe space of the REST APIs because the data could be returned in parts. So it could happen that you have requested like two fields, for example, orders and products separately. However, for some odd reason, product service is not re uh, responding correctly and you could re receive only orders or nothing yeah, as in that uh, scenario. The query was successfully resolved and it was successfully executed and it matches the format. So it's HTTP 200 okay. However, there is no data in the response at all. However, you have pretty verbose error message and it's completely up to your client to deal with that problem. Uh, under that link, there is quite extensive uh, information how to create that kind, of, um, that kind of error handling that is useful. So error handling is tricky, for sure. Moving on, the machine-to-machine -machine communication. With all that coolness of GraphQL, unfortunately, is, in my opinion, not well suited to do any machine-to-machine -machine communication mostly because of that uh, problem with uh, error handling and all of its verbosity. Because uh, in scripting and uh, in server-to-server -server communication, you have to be clear, is that success or not? So in my certain scenario, uh, we kept using REST, of course, because of a lot of tech debt that we have accumulated, but that's a different story. And it was just easier to, uh, to maintain and easier to work with. We kept the GraphQL only on the client facade layer. Moving on, file uploads. Well, with all that static typing, uh, it looks quite tempting to uh, use it also for file uploads. For example, if you have a system that would like to keep some files from the user or take some files from the user. Unfortunately, the schema definition language doesn't uh, support uh, a binary file. Of course, you could smash it into a base64 string and just push it forward. But it's uh, not the perfect scenario, believe me, been there. So it could cause serious performance issue. And I really encourage you to use direct cl cloud uploads to your storage, create some sign your link from your API and just upload from the client. And last but not least, naming. Naming is difficult because in that schema you have single namespace by default. So if you, for example, name something as a product and later on, for example, you are developing the administrative panel or back office application and you need product but with different set of fields, 
but the product is already taken. So you need to be aware of that issue and uh, be careful how to pick your names. However, there is some uh, quite good material how to format the GraphQL schema in order to uh, at least introduce some sort of namespacing. And also another problem could be an N, N plus one queries. Uh, so you could observe that already. Uh, if we have that kind of operation that expands product availability and price for every single product in an order. So what happens if my order contains 100 products? Well, by default, we will do 100 queries for a single product to the product service, and this is not cool. So how to circumvent that problem? And there is a way out of it. So there is a cool pattern that is called the data loader. And the data loader will detect if you are creating uh, or if you are resolving a certain field a lot of times. Because of the asynchronous query execution, you, you could proceed with uh, resolving the entire query tree. And the data loader allows you to group those extensive queries. And instead of doing uh, a query, 100 queries for a single product, you could do one query for a hundred of products and keep your performance on an acceptable level. And that's because of the data loaders. To wrap up, if you are using microservices, you should really consider using API Gateway if you don't have one. And if your use case allows that, you could also consider using GraphQL to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Awesome. Thank you for the talk. I have uh, the following question. Um, do you have uh, any tips and tricks how to analyze what a browser sends to GraphQL? Because, for example, front-end very often sends tons of requests, and all of them was a follow in network uh, tab. Yes. How do, how do you so, do, uh, work with that? If you use Chrome, for example, there is that, that cool extension to Chrome DevTools that is called GraphQL Network, and it will detect uh, and unwrap all the GraphQL queries in a, another tab in the network tools. Thank you. Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you again, Arthur. Thank That's you. Thanks for having me.